Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our second session in our free online conference, Exploring the Voices of Canada's Seniors, a Roadmap to an Age-Inclusive Canada. Today, we have a wonderful session exploring the O in voices, our optimal health and wellness. And we have experts from across this country to help us delve into some of these key issues as we're moving forward in our work. It's critically important that we try to make as many, in fact, all wherever possible of our sessions free to participants. And we really want to take a moment here and thank our sponsors for allowing us to have the resources to put the session on today at a free experience. We also want to thank our co-hosts. We know that you are key partners in trying to make Canada more age inclusive and that your work, which has been happening all across the country, is integral to supporting the well-being of older Canadians. Just a quick run through of how we're going to be engaging in today's conference session. During the course of the session today, your microphones and videos will be turned off during the webinar. If you're interested in adjusting the video size of the speakers, you can follow this information here at the beginning of the webinar and it allows you to play with how you are experiencing this experience. This is being recorded and it's also posted on our website and our YouTube channel. And we are also broadcasting live on Facebook. And we welcome all of you who are joining from Facebook Live today. As we move forward, we're going to give you the opportunity to engage actively in our chat box. And for those of you who may be new to that experience, you'll see the chat button, which you can push and it will open up the side window and then we can engage in it. Do make sure to click all panelists and attendees. It may default to just the panelists, all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see who you are, where you're from, and share a little bit about the work that you're doing. Feel free to also use the chat box to share resources or comments as you are thinking them. If you have a question for today's expert panel, we encourage you to put it into the Q&A and you'll see a little button with two sort of blurbs, balloons coming out of it. It says Q&A. Please feel free to toss your questions in there and we'll make sure that we get to those questions with our expert panel today. At the end of it, you'll have an incredibly brief evaluation come to you and please we do ask that you take just a few seconds and give us that important feedback about how this experience was for you and what you liked and how we can always improve social media is such an important piece for how we are sharing our information today and these are the hashtags for our free online conference canage seniors is our organization canage voices is the platform that we're talking about, age inclusive is overwhelmingly what we're talking about across this conference. And we're talking today about optimal health within our first session. So here's what we're gonna to do today. We are going to introduce just for a few minutes, our major new publication called A Roadmap to Canada's Seniors. And we're bringing up the voices of Canadian seniors. And I'm going to take you through a few slides so you can see where this discussion fits into our broader overview. I'm going to then take a few minutes to introduce the panelists. I know that you've already, I'm sure, checked out their bios, which have been posted on our website and through our social media. But I'll just pull out a few key highlights of our expert panel and their experience to you today. I'm going to ask each one of them, as they come forward, to unmute their video when it's their turn to uh, introduce themselves and I'll call upon them to share from their point of view for about five or seven minutes. What do they think that we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive, particularly around issues of optimal health and wellness. So that means acute, chronic and preventative health. Then we're going to get into it. I'm going to do a moderated panel. I'm going to blend in your questions. We're going to have a really dynamic discourse. And at the end, I just want you to stay tuned for a few extra resources that we've got for you. So with no further ado, let me just take a couple of minutes to introduce you to our Voices of Canada Seniors, a roadmap to an age-inclusive Canada.
So this is a, a big piece of work that we at CanAge did in collaboration with other team members across this country. We engaged in hundreds and hundreds of interviews from the Archbishop of the Anglican Church of Canada to the guy around the corner. We folded in wonderful resources like those that uh, we see at the Canadian Frailty Network and also at the National, the National Institute on Aging. We went through the literature in all of the different fields that we could find and all inquiries, commissions and reports. We blended it all together. We came up with six major compass points as a roadmap for Canada. Now Canada has been so unique in not having this type of roadmap amongst OECD countries. So we hope that this will be a useful document for you. It's really easy to navigate. It's got six compass points and we're talking about the second right now. But if you look online, you will see that you can open like an accordion each of these key issues. So just this morning, we started uh, talking about violence and abuse prevention. So across our six sections, we have 40 issues identified and 135 recommendations ready for policymakers, philanthropy, not-for-profits, community organizations, and individuals to be able to pluck those recommendations out and move forward with making Canada more age inclusive. Today and right now, we're gonna be talking about optimal health and wellness. And these are the key issues that we've identified. Again, under each issue are key recommendations. Let me also just share with you some of the other ones. Infection prevention has perhaps never before been so important. And we talking about it within the context of vaccine uptake and reform and prioritizing seniors, especially during COVID-19. We're also talking about issues of disaster response and what it means to not have a disaster response plans for seniors. And one of the key issues we've all been talking about is that health and housing continuum. And the C in our voices is caregiving, long-term care, home care and housing resources. And we know as though we go across the health and housing continuum, issues like family caregiving supports and national quality standards, infrastructure engagement and home care enhancement are critically important. And as housing prices are sometimes really very challenging for many older people, we're talking about both housing affordability, but also how do you support staying aging in place? Economic security is really critical for so many people during this time of COVID-19, but always we have talked about how to fund a retirement in uncertain times. We're talking about pensions and dispute resolutions with banks and institutions, workforce inclusion, and even things like tax filing for seniors. And our S in social inclusion, our last key issues are about things like loneliness, technology, transportation, rural issues, ageism, indigenous seniors, and how to promote things like intergenerationalism. Again, each one of these expands into key recommendations. It's very, very easy to navigate on our website at canh.ca slash voices. And if you download the PDF, you can see it all at once. So I'm Laura Tamblin Watts. I am the CEO of CanH, Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization. And I get to have the privilege of being your host and moderator today. I'm just gonna take a minute to introduce our expert panelists. Dr. Nathan Stahl has been a wonderful addition to the world of geriatric medicine. And many of you will see how active he's been in bringing forward the voice of older people, as well as sharing critically important information about what the incidence rate are in COVID-19. Nathan is a wonderful addition, as I say, both to our field, but also to the National Institute on Aging, where he's been taken on in a fellowship position. His expertise is robust and he has been really working to blend both research and practice together, as well as raise issues in the community. So thank you so much, Dr. Stahl. John Muscadere is a giant in our field. Thank you, John. And you've been heading up the Canadian Frailty Network and networks of centers of excellence which we know have been wonderful additions to our academic research world, but also in the field of knowledge mobilization. And John has been actively engaged as an intensivist in Kingston General Hospital. He's a professor at Queen's University, the research director of critical care program at Queen's and KGH, Kingston General Hospital. And he's co-chair of the Canadian Critical Cares Trial Group as well. John has keen interest in healthcare systems, but also in making sure that we avoid frailty. And if someone is frail, how do we make sure 
where they can get better or at least manage as well as possible. So we're excited to have Jill on with us today. Sherry Delkey is a PhD and an RN, Associate Professor of Faculty of Nursing at the University of Alberta. And she has had you know, a wonderful career in teaching, administration, acute and community care, and research. She's past president for the Gerontological Association of British Columbia's local chapter and the Edmonton chapter of the Alberta Gerontological Association. She has uh, won research awards and also teaching awards. And Sherry's going to talk a little bit today as, as well about how ageism can inform our thinking with regards to optimal health and well-being. So welcome, Sherry. Dr. Karen Kobayashi is the Associate Dean of Research and the Graduate Studies in the Faculty of Social Sciences. She's a full professor in the Department of Sociology and a research affiliate in the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health at the University of Victoria. You know, amongst her many, many works is real focus on that intersection of social and physical care. She's been working also, uh, not just on the life course perspective, but bringing an ethnocultural lens to her work, often raising issues of personhood and dementia and how the economic, social, cultural, and health dimensions of an aging population really need to be integrated into our systems thinking as well as our response. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Kobayashi. At this point, I am going to invite Nathan Stahl to unmute his video. And I'm going to ask each of our panelists in turn, leading off with Dr. Stahl, who I may just call Nathan because we have a lot of doctors. I think everyone is on this particular call. Nathan, we're excited to hear from you about some of your thoughts on how to make Canada more age inclusive. You've been so active in this area, and I know that your research is really engaged on the intersection of sort of geriatrics and social care. So what do we need to do? Let's kick it off with you. Thanks, uh, and thanks for having me here today. Um, I mean, that's a, a, a very broad question about age uh, inclusivity, but I would argue that um, a lot of the reasons why we don't perceive us to be the most age inclusive society um, and, and a lot of things that have been uh, born uh, or laid bare during the COVID-19 pandemic um, really involves the way we perceive older adults and the way we um, construct social policies and, and, and relevant to the pandemic uh, uh, public health policy um, when it comes to older adults. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, you know, to give you a, a specific example about age inclusivity is, you know, the, the I would say the constant um, dialogue or theme throughout the pandemic um, that you know, we haven't necessarily found a way to protect older adults in this pandemic without isolating them. And I think, you know, that sort of, um, that sort of failure to take into account the specific needs of older adults um, in, in every facet of society, when it comes to building age-friendly cities, when it comes to the way that older adults interact with society on a day-to-day -day basis, is something that has been, as I say, laid bare during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so, you know, really, if you look at, at frameworks, um, you know, the WHO ha has a 10-year campaign on, on uh, healthy aging. There's been multiple campaigns on um, building age-friendly cities. It all stems, uh, I, I would say, from an upstream process of really recognizing that the needs of older adults are different and the way the need to create social infrastructure and social policy um, that differs from the rest of the population and, and we have you know in medicine we have a, a saying as it applies to uh, the difference between children's medicine and old and adult medicine that um, kids aren't just young adults so you can't do the same thing um, for kids that you may do when you're trying to have medical practice for adults or apply something uh, to kids where, where it may or may not have worked in adults and I think the same can be said for a lot of things when it comes to older adults that you know, applying what may work for younger adults does not always work for older adults. Thanks very much, Nathan. We're going to kick off with you there and invite you to mute your video. And I'm going to pull John back in. So John, welcome to our session. Maybe you could share with us a few minutes about what you're thinking we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive. I know that you're working on that every single day. Excited to hear from you some of your thoughts. 
Great, and it, it's uh, really a pleasure to be invited here and to be part of uh, of uh, this panel. And, and I think it really this really fits in with a lot of the things um, that we have been doing at uh, the Canadian Frailty uh, Network, and and it also fits in as Nathan said about. Um, um, the vulnerability that's been highlighted in our society, especially in older people by the COVID uh, pandemic. And some of the most vulnerable people that have been highlighted in this pandemic are, are those living uh, with frailty or with increased vulnerability and reduced function. So we know that over the age of 65, about one in four Canadians are frail. This number jumps to one and two by the age of uh, 85. And people living with frailty are much more likely to be hospitalized, require long-term care and die, especially when they encounter stressors such as, um, uh, such as uh, infections and, and, uh, and COVID-19 is, is, a, is a, a, a tragic example of that. So how do we get there? So how do we get here? How do we have, um, in a, uh, a big s segment of our society a uh, aging with reduced function. Well, so if we look back historically with improvements in social and medical care, we've been able to increase the lifespan and many Canadians live in good health. So for example, uh, through StatsCan, about one in two Canadians at age 85 uh, don't report uh, any chronic uh, conditions. But what we've also done is the opposite. We've, um, through better medical care, through better social care, um, we've increased the lifespan, but also have increased the number of people surviving for much longer with uh, reduced function, more vulnerability or, or, um, or frailty. And what we need to do is rethink our approach to, on a broad societal way, rethink our approach to how we, uh, um, to, uh, to aging, and we need to change our mindset. Up to now, the mindset has been that we want to extend the number of years, but it, instead, uh, we heard that Denmark, uh, um, uh, when we visited in Denmark, that the approach should be not increasing the number of years, but increasing, uh, extending the life in the years that you live. And we need to emphasize the maintenance of function as we grow older. In other words, we need to shift the aging function curve so that people are, are, are functional, are members of our society, um, and continue to be members of our society right till the, the end of, of life. And from a medical point of view, we need to change from managing chronic diseases individually and not look at it and and, uh, and we don't look, tend to look at individuals as a whole, but we need to look at them and, and we need to change that so that we look at them holistically. And in addition, we need to change how our communities, uh, our, our communities function. So as Nathan said, the, uh, the WHO uh, uh, initiatives, uh, so we need to think about how we can make our communities uh, uh, that uh, such that they remain uh, individuals remain connected as they grow older, that they have access to the uh, to proper nutrition, uh, in spite of, regardless of their uh, income, and that they are livable, so that they are amenable to exercise, walking, and interaction. And in order to do this, this is a long-term goal. It's not going to be accomplished in in the next little while. Um, and I, we need to adopt a public health approach to, uh, to aging. And uh, the things that, that there's evidence behind them are, um, as we, in our VOID campaign, are the five elements of our VOID campaign. And a lot of these things are in the Voices campaign too. It's maintenance of activity, promotion of activity as you grow older, uh, attention to vaccination, making sure that you're on the right, number of medications and for the stage of life that you're in, maintenance of social inclusivity, reduction of social isolation, and maintenance of diet, nutrition, adequate amount of protein, adequate amount of vitamin D. And we can do this both at community and individual levels. And by adopting a public health approach that to maintenance, for the maintenance of function as we grow older, 
and uh, uh, I think we can actually change uh, how we uh, view aging and also um, increasing increased function and maintenance of quality of life as we grow older, which I think most of us would value as we reach that age. Certainly for myself, that's that's what I want to see as um, as I age. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, stop and I look forward to the um, to the panel discussion. Thanks very much, John. Really appreciate it and all the great work that you're doing. Excited as well to encourage people to join into the chat. There's all kinds of great resources being shared there. Love to hear where you're calling in from. If you have resources or things that you want to share with people, do share that into the chat. Hi, Maria. I'm glad that you were able to join us today as well. The Q&A is also open. So the little um, double balloon looking thing down at the bottom there, feel free to put your questions into that and we'll make sure to integrate that as well. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you today, Sherry. Perhaps, Sherry, I can get you to unmute your video and join us so we can learn a little bit more about the work that you're doing and, and what you think that we need to do to make our optimal health and wellness more age inclusive. Thanks very much, Sherry, over to you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to join in on this webinar. And my program of research focuses on nursing practice with older people. And in a recent research project, uh, I was looking at how student nurses are socialized to work with older people. And some of the findings were quite surprising. Um, young, some of the students, actually many of the students um, indicated that they were afraid of older people. They didn't know how to communicate with them. And they recognized the ageist perceptions that were in society and yet they were also being perpetuated in healthcare and in, actually in a, the nursing program. Um, one of the participants, I think, really summed it up when he said that it was re we're really in a youth orientated culture and old people are just not shiny and new. And so they saw um, people modeling that that their needs were not as important. And one of the gaps in education that they really noticed was that they really didn't know how to communicate with older people, particularly if they had dementia and it frightened them. Um, I've since developed learning activities to try to address that and it's being attested um, at our university this fall. But um, it really brought to the fore ageism for me. Um, and I know that in jokes in our culture, we make fun of aging all the time, but we really need to think about it because in those um, jokes, though we are enforcing, reinforcing negative stereotypes that older, growing old is associated with physical <clears throat> and mental deterioration, dependence and less social value. Um, and yet, um, and sometimes this humor and even in healthcare, this ageism can uh, be portrayed insidiously, like in the best interest of the older person. Um, and so as even though most Canadians, older Canadians live independently in communities, they experience ageism when they're purchasing goods and services in their family relationships and in institutions. And certainly research has demonstrated that there's a real um, positive correlation between age discrimination and people's low self-esteem, low sense of well-being. So these conscious and unconscious ageist perceptions and stereotypes about aging can, can be manifest in our cognitive and physical functioning. And it can even erode the will to live. Um, so um, I was looking at some research studies and in the US, um, they estimate $63 billion a year are um, being spent in healthcare costs due to ageism. In Europe, they also have reported that older people are treated negatively and undervalued. And there was a study in 2008 in Canada of all people of all ages, and they reported that regardless of culture and religious philosophy, Canadians view older people as less vital and non accommodating. So, what can we do about it for the health and well being of all of us? Because we're all aging. Um, we're all growing older every day. And whatever we can do to promote um, the health and optimal health of older people will 
be to our all best interest. I think we can be aware of some of the common myths of aging and dispel them whenever we hear them. Um, for example, when we grow old, it is not inevitable that we will get dementia, that we will become incontinent, or we will become physically inept. If we feel our physical or mental health is deteriorating, we can be proactive and embrace whatever um, a physical level of physical activity we can do and do it consistently. There have been studies that there's links between physical and cognitive ability. I remember reading a research article about 80 plus year olds who were debilitated after hospitalization and they put them on a, a, a low weight training activity. And after just a few weeks, they experienced increased muscle mass and increased bone density. So this tells me it's never too late to start. And I think something we can all do is um, when we hear about a joke about aging is to think about it, not to internalize it. Instead of laughing about it, to think about it and to try to um, not protect, perpetuate negative stereotypes. And because actually um, other research uh, in the social sciences have found that um, as we age, older people are actually happier than younger people. And part of that's because they focus on positive um, memories, not on negative. And um, that they try to uh, move away from negative experiences and stay with positive um, um, experiences. And I would suggest that we could do that with um, ageism. Instead of focusing on the negative um, stereotypes of aging, we could focus on the positive. Um, because really, if we're afraid of um, aging and we're being anti aging, we're actually being anti living because the opposite of aging is death. And so let's look in the mirror, look at the gray hair and the wrinkles, and embrace them as a sign of um, aging and something positive that we're alive and living. And, um, and that um, it's not something to be afraid. In Canada, we experience all kinds of seasons, and this is just another season of life. It's just a change. Um, there, we can also recognize that older people, although there are age-related changes with aging, they're very heterogeneous in that um, there's a real diverse way in which we experience those age-related changes. And yet older people are integral to all generations. And they have a wealth of knowledge of expertise that can be applied to some of the problems that we all face. And so um, we need to start a movement of older lives matter. And I'll just leave it at that. Thanks so much, Sherry. You know, the question that you raise about, you know, how can you be against aging? If so, you're kind of against living is one that I think has plagued us forever. It's a, it's a peculiar circumstance and, and one that I think we're really challenged by. Great conversations in the chat today as well. Make sure that you have a chance to dig in and out of the chat. You'll see some fantastic resources and some fantastic commentary. Again, our Q&A is open and we're excited to hear from you and weave that into our moderated session. I'm so pleased to share with you one of my dearest, dearest friends, Dr. Karen Kobayashi. Karen, please, uh, please join us here on our proverbial stage. Thanks very much. You know, I, you've been working in this field a long time and, and really bring that intersection of both, you know, medical health and social well-being and social care. Excited to hear from you today about what your thoughts are, about what do we need to do to, to make AIM Canada more age-inclusive when it comes to our optimal health and wellness. Over to you. Thanks so much, Laura, and thank you for the opportunity to participate on, uh, I think, is what is a very important panel uh, today. But before sharing my thoughts, I wanted to acknowledge, with respect, the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory I am coming to you from, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasamich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. So, Laura, you know, as a CanAge fellow, I have to say I'm just very grateful to you and your team for your incredible advocacy efforts over the years, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the issues that are outlined in the Voices Roadmap, 
Uh, I read the roadmap with, with great interest and experienced many aha moments as I made my way through the issues and recommendations. And I saw my own research reflected in many of them. Um, in particular, the issues um, of dementia, mental health, uh, innovation, and systems change. So uh, I'm going to sort of take a page from, I, I, I listened uh, this morning uh, to the Elder Abuse panel, which was fantastic. And Krista James, who's a dear friend of mine uh, as well, um, presented her key message. So I, um, she summed up really nicely. I, I actually wanna start with, I guess, my key message um, with regards to optimal health and wellness. And that key message is that equitable access to health and social care is absolutely essential to making Canada a more age inclusive society. And that requires more than just an acknowledgement of diversity, uh, of difference by, by gender, class, ethnicity, immigrant status, geography, cognitive and physical ability uh, within the older adult population. It actually requires, uh, I believe, a concerted collaborative action by individuals, communities, and governments um, at all levels, municipal, provincial, and federal, to address social inequities among older adults by changing the ways in which we respond to the issues around access to health and social care. And this means that policies, I think, must be revised. They must be constructed uh, to prioritize, first of all, and this is some um, an issue that is very near and dear to my heart right now as I'm working in the area of assistive technology and aging, but we need to prioritize universal access to reliable Wi-Fi as part of essential service plans and affordable technology. Um, when, I talk, when I say that, I'm thinking about assistive technologies really need to be included as part of provincial health and social care procurement plans if we are indeed committed to supporting technology as a key way, I think, to achieve optimal health and wellness. And when we think about optimal health and wellness, I'm thinking about um, mental, physical, social, and spiritual, as you've outlined in the roadmap, for all. So uh, here, I wanna give a shout out, and, and certainly this is one of the recommendations, um, under the issues around innovation, it, I want to give a shout out to the great work uh, that's being done by AgeWell, and I know Alex was uh, on the panel, Alex Mihalidis was on the panel yesterday. I want to give a shout out to AgeWell uh, and organizations like CanAssist at the University of Victoria for the incredible work they're doing to bring assistive technologies to the public. That is to older adults, to informal caregivers, informal caregivers. Uh, and to healthcare practitioners in communities across Canada. And they're doing this. They're, they're developing the technologies in a collaborative and participatory way that underscores the importance, I think, of engaging meaningfully with key stakeholders. And this means that they're committed to co-creating the technologies. I think co-creation is so important in this, in this process. So co-creating with, with key stakeholders older adults, caregivers, and healthcare practitioners, rather than creating these technologies in isolation, in academic, sort of in research silos. So what I would say um, as a researcher um, who's, who's actively uh, involved right now in assistive technology uh, design and evaluation, um, and as a social scientist who is prioritizing equitable access to those technologies, is that we need collaborative participatory approaches to research uh, to ensure that technologies are adopted and they're not abandoned um, by those who, who are the, the target users of them. So it, this kind of an approach really, I think is the only way that we can uncover, that we can discover, uncover the challenges like low digital literacy, sensory impairment, cognitive difficulties, mobility issues, and fatigue that are often um, implicated uh, in the use of uh, when older adults uh, and their caregivers um, are given assistive technologies to use. And certainly what we know, uh, and I wanna 
you know, acknowledge that COVID-19 has uh, initiated a burning platform for accelerating the implementation of online communication technologies uh, to help in, you know, reduce um, issues of social isolation and loneliness what, um, and sustain care networks for older adults and to help them to maintain uh, a good uh, quality of life, uh, a higher level or a, a good level of mental health. Um, and I know that these are issues that you've covered in your roadmap. I'm particularly, as I said, interested in issues of dementia, uh, mental health, innovation, and systems change. And there are a number of um, wonderful research examples uh, from BC, but also from my, my colleagues across Canada, um, who I am in collaboration with. Um, there are a number of excellent examples that I'd be happy to share during the Q&A. So thank you. I'll leave it there. Thanks so much. So much to work from. I'm going to invite all of our panelists to join now. So to unmute your video as we get into our bit of our roundtable conversation. We've had a great opportunity to launch the discussion today and lots to work with. When we're thinking about optimal health and wellness, you know, we are really addressing both the physical well-being and also our social factors in that. And one of the issues that we really haven't talked too much about is our mental health factors as well. And I, I wonder if I could just kind of kick off a little bit there. Nathan, you've been focused a lot on the well-being of older, um, really older residents in particularly in long-term care, although I understand that your practice is broader than that. I'm wondering if you can just share for us what some of your observations have been about maybe the intersection between physical well-being, like actual physical markers that you might evaluate, like activities of daily living and so on, and kind of mental impact that COVID-19 has had? Yeah, well, I would uh, argue they're interconnected um, directly. Um, so, you know, one of the things that has been seen, and not just in uh, long-term care dwelling uh, older adults, but in community dwelling older adults as well, uh, has been that uh, this population, uh, older adults, has seen substantial collateral damages as a result, uh, not, not from being necessarily infected by COVID-19, but by the conditions that are imposed upon society and the public health restrictions, the blunt public health uh, interventions and restrictions that ensue with that. And so, um, you know, the, this kind of data has actually been harder uh, to collect and is far uh, you know, not as, uh, not as evident um, uh, in all jurisdictions, but we've seen in several that rates of loneliness um, and social isolation are extremely high. Um, we've, we've heard a few reports, particularly in long-term care homes that have had a really restrictive visitor policies that there have been um, huge declines in psychological well-being. Uh, I've had caregivers tell me that when they re-entered long-term care homes after the lockdown, that their loved one no longer recognized them anymore because of the cognitive declines that they sustained. And then relatedly, there's the physical declines. That, um, and, and so I see them a bit of, of, of chicken and egg because, um, you know, they've had lack of physical activity, which leads to worse emotional well-being. And then the worse emotional well-being has led to uh, more functional decline. Um, so there has been huge physical and uh, functional decline that has ensued from this as well. I mean, you think about some of the residents were essentially confined to their room for the better part of three to four months in many places of our country. So, um, and, and you know, to paint a picture of the extreme in Ontario, we actually had a resident where the coroner deemed the death of one of the long-term care residents as being from malnutrition, which is uh, almost unheard of in in modern Canadian society. So they did not die from COVID-19, they died from the, the conditions that were surrounding them. So the, it has been a hugely uh, troubling thing. And I think one of the things we'll see um, if, if data does come out on this, but the other maybe sort of these sort of survey-based instruments, which older adults are often excluded from, but one of the markers that people are really looking at are what's called excess mortality. Um, and so we know there's been excess mortality during the time of the pandemic. If you compare the number of deaths in Canada from March to you know, October of 2020, uh, compared to what was expected at the start of this year. But not all of those COVID-19, not all of those deaths are COVID-19 deaths that are excess deaths. And so there's been excess deaths from overdoses and there's 
uh, in younger populations. And there's probably been many excess deaths um, that were non-COVID, not from the virus itself, but indirectly from the virus and the things that have been going on in society. Uh, thanks so much. I mean, and certainly we've been having lots and lots of reach out from people, as I'm sure you're having in your experience, either directly as, as folks that you're taking care of, but just even people reaching out and saying, you know, I, I feel so lonely, I could die. And, and actually seeing that intersection between that mental well-being and that physical well-being. I'm going to pick up on this thread and kind of turn it to you, Karen, if I can. You've spent a lot of your career looking at the intersections of ethnocultural diversity and inclusion and health and, and some of the differential cultural aspects about sort of physical health and mental health within ethnocultural and diverse communities. I just wondered if you could share maybe some of your insights for our how we need to do better for our aging population. Yeah, thanks, Laurie. I didn't really underscore that so much in my opening remarks, but certainly that's been the, the crux of my, uh, of my research program. And, and it continues to be as I look at this technology as well, but certainly um, ethnocultural minority or racialized uh, and immigrant communities uh, have been hit extremely hard uh, during this pandemic. And Bonnie Henry was talking about this yesterday. She did a talk up at the University of Victoria. Um, she was talking about this as just, she was referring to the virus and the impact that the virus had. But she said, really, I, I, what I should be saying is it's the pandemic response, right? That has been, it's not the virus, it's, it's the pandemic response and, and all of the, the measures, the public health measures that have been um, uh, enforced um, you know, in the provinces um, over the last uh, six months. And, and ethnocultural minority uh, older adults, many of whom, a large number of whom are foreign born, um, or in other words, are immigrants uh, and refugees, um, have had, um, you know, Nathan was referring to social isolation and loneliness. We've done um, some preliminary data collection with, uh, with immigrants and settlement organizations. And, and we are actually, uh, I'm part of a, a large project looking at social isolation um, out of Ryerson University right now, a SHRC partnership grant for seven years, that's looking at the experience of social isolation and loneliness among older adults and refugees. And we know that the pandemic uh, certainly has exacerbated or um, certainly uh, multiplied the negative effects on mental health uh, and well-being of older adults in these communities. So in addition to uh, you know, all of the issues around language, um, you know, access to programs and services um, with reference to their language ability, uh, they are now being sort of, uh, you know, they're not, uh, older adults in these communities uh, are saying that um, very quietly that there have been issues of, uh, and this refers, this goes back to your first panel this morning, of abuse within the context of intergenerational households, um, particularly for those who are sponsored uh, and who are feeling um, pressure uh, to abide by, uh, I think, um, the, 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 the sort of rules and regulations that have been standard or put forth in, in, the, in the houses in which they reside, currently co-reside uh, with their children. So there are these issues of abuse uh, mental health declines, uh, the fact that, uh, the, the, you know, the, the trip to the, the community centers for their ESL classes have now been halted. Um, they are, they fear going out. There's a lot of misinformation there. Uh, this was one of the um, uh, immigrant and refugee settlement organizations in the city was talking about uh, misinformation as a significant issue because older adults from, um, you know, other, um, countries, East Asian, South Asian uh, countries uh, are still getting the majority of their information around the pandemic, about the pandemic from their home countries. And so, and it doesn't transfer over, of course, to this context, the, the Canadian context very well. So that's something as uh, we've been we are currently starting research in that area, um, my colleague in psychology and I. So more to come on this. Thank you so much, Karen. You know, we, those challenges laid out are, are so robust. It was really interesting to hear that that originating country 
is a place that they're getting that key information from. I, I didn't know that. And it's a, such an important thing when we're thinking about things like health and well-being to understand where some of those resources, where you're getting that knowledge is. John, you have been in the business of knowledge generation and knowledge mobilization for years now. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit more about how important it is to avoid frailty. You've got your big campaign out there with great resources on avoiding frailty. Surely, you know, some of the things that we hear, particularly, you know, mom slipped and fell, she broke her hip, and she's never been the same, or you know, within 18 months, in fact, you know, chances of increased uh, mortality up to 40%. And, and we know that, you know, you've got some great resources out there as part of our campaign to support optimal health and wellness. I want you to just share a little bit about your work on avoiding frailty. Sure. Uh, thank you. And um, so ju just to, uh, and uh, um, just before I go about uh, on that, I just want to add a bit about the, uh, I think the impact of the pandemic on aging in Canada. And, and I think um, the pandemic has exposed the poor state of aging affairs in Canada. And it's really highlighted all those things that were a problem that we knew were a problem and now they've become right to the forefront. So if we really want to make our societies much more, our society much more resilient, we need to address those in the long term. There's short-term fixes that are required, and and hopefully we don't um, we don't address just the short-term fixes at the expense of ignoring the long term, which tends to be something that is really done within the political cycle, which is only a couple of years. So uh, we need to advocate for long-term fixes and. And in regards to, and this leads on to some of the work that we've been doing with, uh, with Avoid, we know the strategies and we know the evidence behind the strategies that can, um, that can improve aging as we go along. So maintenance of activity, the reduction of social isolation, not being on too many medications, adequate nutrition, and all those, all those things, but they haven't been really um, really apply or really uh, the uptake has been poor. So for example, things like vaccination, the uptake is still very, is still not as good as we would like in, 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 older, in older people. So how do we do that? First of all, we need to change our mindset that frailty and redu reduction of function is not an inevitable part of aging. As soon as we do that, then we start to think about how we can uh, change things. And then we need to extend, um, and if we really don't want to get those things um, applied, then we want to look at communities and leverage the power of communities, municipalities at the local level to implement those changes. Those changes are not going to come about at the federal, well, they will be encouraged by governments at higher levels, but they're going to act at the, at the, um, um, at, at the community level, at the municipality level, and we can, and so we can leverage uh, movements such as the age-friendly community, compassionate communities to address aging and actually implement those. And there's a lot of people working on aging, or a lot of resources out there, but they're not coordinated. So we further need to coordinate all our efforts such that we apply evidence to improve the aging, uh, the aging function curve. And also, we'll be, if we do that, then we'll be able to apply newer things um, that uh, as they come about to, that are increasingly shown to, uh, to improve outcomes. So uh, it has to be both the responsibility on the individual level and the community level to, to make, uh, to make these, uh, these changes. Fantastic. I'm going to turn to you, Sherry, in our conversation before we go to a poll. We've got a couple of fun polls to do, and we're doing them throughout our session as well. I wonder if, if you could share with us, you know, that, that top line thing that you do this with when you're trying to get people to understand how big a problem ageism is in the health sector. We're talking about people who are trained to provide healthcare services. So we're not talking to people on the street. These are people who are trained to provide healthcare services to older people. Like, what are that kind of dinner party top line, you know, information that you say to people about how challenging it is? Can you share a little bit of that with us? 
Um, well, it is really frustrating because, um, and what I've, what I've come to is it's just because ageism is so insidious and accepted in our society that people come with those ageist perspectives. And I think unless we actually address them and say, no, it's not inevitable that this, this, or that, all these negative things are going to happen to people. Um, um, and then we go into, we put them in the profession and it's almost like we perpetuate it. I think this likely is occurring in, in all health professions where um, they are exposed to clinical settings where they're seeing in the hospital, the frail people, the older, more dependent. And they're not recognizing that, you know, maybe a week ago that person was golfing or um, riding their bike for 10 kilometers. So, and it's so frustrating to try to get that. I, I've come to the place where I think we really need to have a national initiative where we're uh, like Black Lives Matter, older lives matter. Um, one of the things in Alberta that recently, just before school, a lot that was in the media was about the need for more funding for schools, for students to go back to be safe in COVID. And uh, I thought, well, that's great. I'm glad they say that. But how come we're not hearing anything in the media about the need to put more money in for older people who are most vulnerable um, due to COVID? How come we're not saying, okay, yes, certain nursing homes are having outbreaks and they're doing everything they can to contain it. How come we're not saying, um, look, we need more resources. We need um, uh, more resources to look after these people, not just for COVID, but all the time. That's what made me think. Thanks very much. I really appreciate that. It's so important to remember that, you know, healthcare providers aren't sort of separate from society. They didn't kind of get born in this idea. They're coming into the sector with, uh, with their own perspectives. I'm reflecting back, and, and Karen, you and I talked about this before, a, a now quite a bit of older study by Dr. Michael Gordon, who has been very involved in the field of geriatrics, very well-known geriatrician, who did a study about you know, the ageist attitudes or attitudes towards older people coming into med school and then leaving med school. And the sum of that study, and this was back in the early 2000s, was it was really bad with ageist beliefs going into med school and it was way worse coming out of med school. So there's this opportunity, and I know that your work, Sherry, is going to be really important in, in helping to move that needle. Christian, we're going to go to our next, our first poll, and we've got two polls planned here, and it's a, it's a little bit of a fun one to get us going. You know, when we're sharing this idea of health and wellness, you know, we're asking our question, which one does it include? Is it physical health, emotional health, social health, spiritual health, mental health, or all of the above? And we'll just leave it open for people to respond. What do we think when we think of health? Uh, do you think it's all of them, some of them? Which of them do you think? leave it open for a few minutes as well and after we finish this poll we're going to go to our next poll right away afterwards and then head into our q a very good so again asking what do we think when we think of our optimal health and wellness which does it include is it physical health emotional health social spiritual mental or is it all of the above Oh, it's a good point from Courtney in here. Should we also include sexual health as the part of optimal health and wellness? I think that, uh, I think it's a really critically important part. Thanks so much. We really appreciate that, that input, Courtney. We're just going to close the poll and we're going to close it now. Perfect. Well, we can see overwhelmingly in our sharing of results, about 95% of the folks who were on it think that it's really about that integrated model. But it's important to know we've got a couple people who voted in for for each of those areas. So that's really important. Let's do our next poll before we go on. Christiane, I'm just gonna get our next poll up. And in our next poll, we're gonna dig a little bit deeper as we go forward and, and ask some different questions. So as we are uh, chairing that poll, we'll let that get organized for a second. Diana, while we're getting organized for a poll, I'm just gonna call to you in a few minutes and get ready for our Q&A. So we are launching our poll on optimal health and wellness number two. Have you or someone you know faced difficulty accessing a family doctor or primary care team? Have you or someone you know ever faced difficulty accessing a family doctor or a primary care team? Well, I'm calling in from a little rural community in Nova Scotia, and I know which way that I'm going to be voting for that. 
Last time, I'm just going to put it again. Have you or someone you know ever faced difficulty accessing a family doctor or a primary care team? We're just going to end the poll here and I'll share the results with you. Well, not very surprising, but also not very encouraging. 86% of the respondents said that the answer was yes, and 14% had said the answer is no. So 86% of people said yes, they'd had a, an obstacle for themselves or somebody else. Diana, we got great questions in our Q&A today, and I'm very pleased to introduce Diana Cable, our Director of Policy and Advocacy. All right, which one are we gonna to address today from our Q&A session? The first one I'm going to address is from Courtney Day. How do we help older adults to move beyond the idea that pain is a fact of growing older? How do we help older adults to advocate for themselves when a doctor tells them pain and cognitive dysfunction is a fact of growing older? Oh, Nathan, I'm throwing that one over to you. You're nodding and I know that this is one that you're talking about. So many of us just think, oh, I'm getting old, I'm in pain. And, and we also aren't always treating pain. So I would love you to think about in your answer, could you share a little bit about kind of where pain goes in, in our thinking about aging, but also in our thinking about treatment? Yeah, so a uh, very important uh, question. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right that uh, a lot of conditions that are perceived to be part of quote unquote healthy aging are, are not. And that's a perception held by many healthcare practitioners themselves, um, not just general society. So I, I think increasingly some things are now being recognized as uh, you know, geriatric syndromes of importance, but there's a huge deficit there. Um, related, I would argue, and this is not unique to the field of medicine, to a lack of uh, education about care of older adults across many healthcare disciplines, um, which, which results in, in those sort of misperceptions. The other thing uh, I, I would say to that, particularly for pain, you know, it, the, the majority of older adults are also women, and women are well known uh, when they present to uh, healthcare settings to seek care to be dismissed uh, as having complaints that are more psych psychological or them being attributed to emotional reasons rather than them addressing the underlying potential organic reasons and to be offered um, more invasive therapy for that pain. So there's a classic study of looking at patients who arrive for knee replacement or to consider knee replacements for pain from their osteoarthritis and men are much more likely than women to be offered knee replacements. So I think challenging those two assumptions and being um, recognizing those two uh, you know, fixed and often, or often fixed and, and, and false sort of assumptions that incur are very uh, important to do. And, and some of that will come with uh, increased education and care of the older adults across multiple disciplines. Treating pain in older adults is a particularly challenging thing, um, particularly when it's chronic pain as opposed to acute pain from a short-lived incident. Um, there are multiple guidelines, I can share them in the chat from, from geriatric societies uh, and, and elsewhere, but what works best and the best evidence support, that supports it is what's known as a multimodal approach. So not relying simply on, on medications, often relying on non-pharmacological approaches as well. Things like exercise, cognitive behavioral therapy, education about pain. And the reason that's uh, important is because evidence supports it, but also for many of the pain medications beyond the initial ones uh, in, the la in the pain ladder, such as Tylenol, the, the older adults are more susceptible to the adverse effects of those drugs, whether it's falls or confusion, uh, constipation. And so those two reasons make a multimodal approach to pain management um, the optimal approach in older adults. That's, that's wonderful. I, I'm going to talk about pain a bit more and I'm going to bring out Karen into it. Karen, you know, one of the areas that we're looking for technology to help us is in pain management and avoiding pain. But there's also some really interesting cultural and social notions to pain. And I, I wonder if you could explore a little bit of the idea of pain and aging and how that might be impacted by either technology or some cultural implications. Mm, yeah, there, there's a, absolutely, in, in some sort of cultural communities, there's a reticence to discuss pain or to present, uh, you know, one as a candidate to um, uh, a healthcare professional 
uh, to disclose issues of pain, particularly when I'm going to go back to these sort of immigrant and refugee groups that we study, uh, when there's a fear that, uh, and I'm going to go on the social side here, of course, but uh, when there's um, a fear that they, it, it will affect somehow their sponsorship. Uh, in other words, their, their citizen, you know, their, uh, their trajectory to citizenship. So um, there's sort of um, reticence to disclose uh, certainly issues that, that are related to pain, pain management uh, is something that, um, that's been, uh, that we've discovered in, in some of the work that we've done, more qualitative work that we've done. The other is sort of the gendered nature of uh, pain disclosure <laughs> in um, racialized minority communities uh, or racialized communities uh, or in, in ethnic cultural minority communities, again, largely immigrant communities, where um, men sort of bear pain uh, to a particular degree or expected to, right? Sort of a masculine kind of trait. Um, and so men are less likely, and I know this is true not only in racialized communities, but outsiders are less likely to present themselves as candidates. Uh, they, will, they will endure pain for longer periods of time. Um, women um, are reticent to present themselves oftentimes because uh, they fear if there's an incongruence culturally between themselves and a physician. Uh, or a rehab therapist or something, uh, that that person will not understand the etiology of their, uh, of their, of their issue. Uh, it, it, and again, it, it wouldn't have cultural sensitivity around that. So I think that's, um, uh, it's interesting. So Nathan was talking about other sort of, you know, multimodal approaches. There are, um, you know, Scott Lear's work um, on cardiovascular health in the South Asian community in, in Vancouver or in the greater Vancouver area, the lower mainland, um, has found certainly that women um, who are um, uh, presented with, uh, you know, this, the options for um, attending exercise programs um, as part of their, as, as part of a, I guess, a, a regimen, a, a practice, a routine uh, to ensure that they continue to uh, be healthy, heart healthy. Um, they will not attend community-based programs um, that are not culturally sensitive, where they can't wear the, the you know, they're, they're sorry. Um, they don't want to um, participate necessarily in groups. Um, with people that they don't feel comfortable with. So I think that, the, the, you know, I know we I sort of moved away from the issue of pain, but it, it certainly um, addresses the issue of presentation as, uh, of older adults who are ethnocultural, ethnocultural minorities or from racialized communities uh, to present themselves um, as candidates for um, diagnosis or treatment. Uh, that's so fascinating, Karen. Thank you. I want to pivot to something that John had said earlier, and I, I confess early on that vaccines are kind of a bit of a passion of mine, and one that, you know, it's been hard to get people excited about for many years, and now it's the only thing that we talk about. In some cases, it feels like that's a, a key point. And John, you've done a bunch of work and a lot of thinking about keeping people healthy and well. You know, as we're coming into the fall, like I am really worried about the flu season, although we've seen some flattening of flu in our neighbors to the south, but I'm worried about viral pneumonia. <laughs> I'm worried, I'm excited that, you know, Shingrix is just covered. I wonder if you could speak a little bit, you know, kind of avoiding frailty, but what are the important roles of preventive medicine of vaccines in keeping people uh, healthy and well and being more age inclusive? Sure, uh, thank you. Um, I, I think vaccines are an incredibly important uh, aspect of, of keeping people healthy. And, um, and, um, and there's three vaccines that are really important. So the first one is influenza vaccination. And so, and. I think some of the reluctance with influenza vaccination is that um, influenza is perceived to be the self-limiting disease that doesn't cause any long-term uh, problems. Uh, well, that, that may be the case when you're, when you're young and you can have a few days of being sick, but when you're older, 
it may transition somebody from being well to to uh, to a state where they may not be able to function independently and have prolonged illness. So um, in my other role as a, um, as an ICU doctor, I see people um, commonly being admitted to, to, to hospital and to ICU with influenza uh, pneumonia. And they will go on to spend long periods of time in hospital, lose function, and many of those people may never recover their, their functional uh, independence that they had before, uh, uh, before they came in. So uh, very important to, to have influenza vaccination and, and also there's evidence that in certain selected group of people, um, the high dose influenza vaccination may provide more, more, uh, more benefit. The other two ones that are uh, important are pneumococcal vaccination in, uh, in, in uh, people over the age of 65. That's a one-time vaccination. It doesn't prevent all forms of pneumonia, but uh, prevents uh, strep pneumonia, which can be really a uh, severe uh, cause of pneumonia. And the last one is, uh, is shingle vaccination. Now shingles, again, is one of these things that uh, may be short, uh, short-lived, but it may also cause long-term problems, um, long-term pain, which may be very difficult to manage, especially in people who are older that may have adverse effects uh, from, uh, from pain medications as we uh, just uh, discussed. So all, all of those are, are, really, are really important uh, to, uh, to, to think about. And thanks very much. And I know that you know people are really worried about staying healthy. You know, every sniffle and every little cough. I tear. I take allergy medication every morning because I'm terrified that I'm going to make someone think I've got COVID nineteen when really it's ragweed season. You know. One of the things that we're having a real challenge with, of course, is thinking about how to make sure we get your flu shot and other vaccines as well. And we have some great chat in the box over here. MyfluShot.ca is a great resource. You can register to get the information about when the flu shot for you. And you got to make sure you get the right one. Again, that high dose flu, that enhanced uh, type of seniors appropriate one. And also to make sure that you're getting the right uh, the right shots for you. So myfluShot.ca, it's, uh, it's, it's run with Immunize Canada. We're helping to support people know that you can book that shot. So we can't have 30 people in a waiting room getting your shots anymore. You can't go to the pharmacy with 50 other people. So this is a great innovation, myfluShot.ca. We'll, we'll share that around as well. Um, you know, I know that, that I was cheering when the government of Ontario just made its announcement about the new finally covering uh, shingles. And I'm just gonna take a little bit here to say that remember, it's all provincial. And so, you know, Karen, I'm looking to you in BC and you are in a very different circumstance with a lot of your coverages. They're really very uh, out of date quite often. The ones that are not, they haven't modernized as well. So we're see that, you know, we got some coverage. We're happy to see that the appropriate seniors, you know, high dose and advanced uh, flu shots were covered by the federal government for the provinces, but we know there's a lot of way to go. Only, depending, you know, six to 8% of all Canadian seniors, of course, live in long-term care. So it's, we have to get the rest of the, the community covered as well. So we're really happy to see some progress, but it's certainly not progress across this country. Um, it's, it's bit by bit and it's, it's a hard fought and hard won. Sherry, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to come to you, but before I do, I know that there's a great question that Diana has got ready. And so I'm just going to pull into uh, the great pocket of questions that Diana's got ready for us. And then I'm going to toss it over your way. So I'm giving you a little bit of a heads up on that. Diana, what's our next question in our Q&A? Uh, our next question in our Q&A is discussing prescription pills. And it's from Monica Lees. With all due respect, I find it very disturbing to attend a senior's home to, to see so many prescription pills. Are doctors looking at nutrition and whole health or just treating symptoms? Seniors rely so much on their doctors and their words, and I fear that proper follow-up or nutrition information is not given. Is there a need to educate seniors on nutrition and wellness? So Sherry, you see why I was coming to you and giving you the heads up that I was heading your way on that. So what do we have to say to Monica? I know that prescribing and deprescribing is a critical issue for all of us, but maybe you've got some thoughts about that broader question on wellness. Um, certainly. Um, I think um, 
looking at yourself holistically, and of course, nutrition is important, um, getting some exercise, being in social, um, so in having social engagement, um, there is a very interesting um, TED talk that you can look at about, uh, and it's about 20 minutes about living to be a hundred. I'll try to get the link and, and post it in the chat. And what they did is they looked at uh, the hot spots. The researchers looked at the five hot spots in in the world, and there were common things that. Uh, um, promoted people to live long and healthy. And one was a physical activity, not necessarily an exercise program, but something that's built into your day. So it might be gardening, it might be, you know, um, um, I live on a farm, so it's walking around in the farm might be enough, just some sort of activity. Um, having something meaningful in your life, whether it be your family or something that you're doing, some work that you're doing, um, and eating, um, eating well, um, more plant-based, but definitely with some protein. Um, actually, they also suggested that um, uh, alcohol in moderation was okay. Um, and, um, and the community, the sense of community, and all of these things in these hot spots contributed to people living long and healthy lives. So um, they're all things that we can do. Well, I'm glad to hear I can have my glass of wine or my glass of champagne. As I say, you know, I shouldn't have to give up absolutely everything. I like to choose the studies that confirm my own beliefs. And that's actually a bit of a joke, of course. But, you know, confirmation bias is a piece that we're often looking at in terms of our health and well-being. Nathan, I want to pull it over to you a little bit to, again, respond to that question about preventive health and wellness, but maybe speak a little bit more about, you know, what you're seeing from your perspective as well. Yeah, so, you know, the question about prescribing in long-term care has been an intense focus of quality improvement initiatives, um, particularly as it relates to some of the higher risk medications like antipsychotics, and there's been some fantastic um, quality improvement initiatives. New Brunswick has actually been a, a real leader in this in terms of targeting reduction in, in rates of prescribing of antipsychotics. Um, you know, a lot, I, I definitely agree with Sherry about the um, you know, the upstream preventative uh, measures that are needed to promote longevity and healthy aging. The challenge is when we're dealing with a long-term care population, um, you know, they're often, at, they're often beyond that in many ways in that they have multiple medical conditions. Uh, they take on average, you're right, 10 or more medications. And there are many challenges with the way that the long-term care system is organized in terms of provision of medical care that makes... Um, people more likely to receive medications than some of the non-pharmacological approaches uh, that would include weight loss uh, or for weight loss and nutrition and, and healthy aging. Um, so yes, definitely, I think there is a lot of work we can continue to still do in our long-term care population uh, in terms of targeting inappropriate medications, uh, reducing the overall burden of medications that many older adults are taking. And yes, it is shocking when you, you know, when I admit a patient to hospital and I have to go through their list from uh, the long-term care home and it's like eight pages long, and, you know, um, often that's actually part of the Thing that takes the longest is inputting all their medications and so I experienced that frustration in the acute care hospital as well but I, I do think there are some great uh, leaders in our country uh, when it comes to prescribing I'd highlight Kara Tenenbaum uh, in Montreal and I'd highlight uh, the Briere uh, in, in Ottawa as real leaders uh, in this field and then again New Brunswick in terms of the work they've done uh, with antipsychotic deprescribing. So we do have a lot of uh, lights we can look to to help improve care and prescribing in this way. Well, and just building on that, Nathan, you know, I know that people often when they're saying, you know, what kind of medications you're on, you know, they may tell you about a couple of them, but they may not think to tell you about their insulin because they think, well, that's not a medication. That's just something I take. And then you get a little bit deeper. And what other kind of herbalist treatments might you be on? And, you know, then you start thinking about, well, are you, how much Advil are you taking or Tylenol are you taking? So again, that piece about, you know, when we're talking about it, how can we really clear about getting all that good information? And then again, that's sometimes a little bit of shame 
in, uh, in what they're taking and maybe they don't want to uh, explain that as much to their healthcare providers. That kind of dovetails us beautifully into our next question, doesn't it, Diana? Maybe you could share for the panel. And, and for this question, I'm going to come to each one of you in turn. So just a little bit of a heads up. I'm going to ask all of you a little bit on this one. Diana, what's our next question? Our next question is from Lawrence Line. A person's idea of optimal health may be different from a healthcare professional's definition, which may lead to disagreements about treatment, prescription, etc. How would you address this when delivering patient-centered care while keeping inclusivity, inclusivity in mind? Yeah, I mean, I think if we could answer that question, we could answer a lot of things. That's a great question, Lawrence. And you can see why I wanted to tell the panel and I wanted to get their kind of top line thoughts for off. Sure, it's okay to start with you. So again, a person's idea of optimal health may be different from the healthcare professional's uh, definition, which can lead to disagreements about treatment and prescription. How do we address this when still trying to keep a patient focused center and an, and an age-inclusive idea? What, what are some of the thoughts that you have on that? Um, well, certainly, um, person-centered care is something that is really swept across healthcare, um, and unfortunately, sometimes it isn't enacted in the essence in the way it's to be. So, if you're not getting that, I would I would suggest that whoever that person is is to to have the resources so you can educate your healthcare provider about why you want to choose that. I think that um, healthcare providers need to listen to older persons because they're not going to follow a regime if they're not buying into it. And I just wanted to go back to one point that Nathan was saying about long-term care. And I totally agree about, you know, in my experience in long-term care. And one of the things I want to highlight is that sometimes nurses, um, although well-meaning, um, may, may be perpetuating that because there isn't the time to address things, pain in non-pharmacological ways. And so they may be reaching out to a physician for that prescription. And that's why I think we really need to look at um, that population and how it's resourced. Um, so if we were resourced to give them better quality of life, um, other alternatives, non-alternatives, that it would, it would go a long way. So I, I totally agree with you. Sorry for derailing that uh, topic. No, I not at all. That's that's great. Thank you so much, um, Karen. Turning it over to you. And and again, we're thinking about you know so many times people are expert in their own health. You know, we talk about you know person centered care, and people are experts in their own health and wellness, but we don't always agree with what healthcare providers say. And and that's a challenge in our social and emotional and mental health care uh, systems and in people. You know, do you have thoughts about you know, in your research and in your work about, you know, navigating that challenge or, or who should we listen to and how do we address some of those thoughts? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, certainly in uh, minority communities, <laughs> there is a lot of incongruence, I think, between, um, especially if it's, a, it, again, sort of with Western trained physicians and sort of recently immigrated uh, older adults and their families uh, to not comply with, um, you know, with uh, recommendations um, that are made by the physician or, or other healthcare practitioners. Uh, I've, we often found, and in a lot of the qualitative work that we had done in Vancouver uh, with older adults and their families around this, that they would seek out complementary and alternative medical practitioners to supplement the uh, recommendations or what they would say <laughs> were recommendations given by their physician, uh, which obviously create, it, it has the potential to create, um, you know, a, 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 con a worsened condition or consequences are things like a worsened condition or, uh, you know, um, another morbidity added on top. Uh, as a result of taking something that uh, wasn't prescribed. Um, but the, you know, there is a, a belief, things like Tai Chi and Qigong and, you know, when we talk about optimal health, uh, I think that what um, healthcare practitioners really need to think about are the alternatives in that exist, like programs in the community, um, you know, physical health uh, programs, um, Besides walking groups, what else would make sense to this person? 
Um, so actually the person-centeredness, the person-centered care model would say that we need to ask the individual and their family. We know that immigrant seniors uh, don't make decisions on their own, that you ask them a question, it's a family decision, um, oftentimes a caregiver and or a family decision, right? So it's important to have family involvement, uh, engagement um, in any sort of a, a meeting uh, to discuss uh, health plan, health plan, healthcare planning down the road. Um, adult day programs were, were listed in your, <laughs> in the roadmap and i have to say that the most recent study that we just finished in um, burnaby bc uh, was with a program in the japanese community called iki iki which is a person the vancouver sun covered this um, program they sent a reporter out because he said wow this has been really successful for those who are diagnosed with mci uh, or moderate stages or in the moderate stage of dementia why is it working so well it is exactly because it is a person-centered model that they're using um, to address issue. and it's a respite program as well for caregivers so i know there's a question in there about caregiver burnout that's coming up but um, certainly i think it's really important uh, for governments to think about supporting the kind of programming in communities that is um, I, that, that is of a person-centered nature. Um, this has worked very well in ethnocultural minority communities and this kind of program, Ikiiki, which focuses on uh, holistic well-being, uh, physical, mental, spiritual, social, uh, among Japanese, Canadian, older adults, uh, taking into account um, intergenerational trauma or historical trauma from the internment, et cetera, I think uh, is a model that other uh, minority communities are following uh, in BC. Thanks very much. I'm going to turn to you, John. Again, that tension between kind of a person-centered approach and sometimes some people just don't want to do what the healthcare provider wants to do. Some, some thoughts and tips around navigating that so people can stay well. I know that this has been, I'm sure, part of your practice for many years and a, a bit of an art form, I imagine, that you have to work with on a regular basis. Well, um, yeah, no, that, that's, uh, and I agree with, with everything that, that's been said. And, important, and the most important aspect is that as healthcare professionals or anybody that's delivering care, you need to deliver that care within a patient's goals in mind. What are their, what are their expectations? What, do they, what can they realistically achieve? And, and that should be your ultimate goal as any healthcare provider. And, and, that's, and that conversation is conversations that a lot of times in the busyness of practice, we don't have um, and we need to, that should be the alpha. The first thing that's done in any encounter to, to actually delineate those goals. The really big challenge comes when you're not able to articulate those goals yourself. And, and the most important thing there is to let your, um, your loved ones or care deciders or powers of attorney, uh, of attorney know what your wishes are, especially as you reach uh, the um, the end of life. So what are your end of life wishes is what we struggle with uh, day in and day out that people don't advocate for themselves or their families don't know what their wishes would have been such that you can take into account their goals and wishes in planning whatever care or whatever care is offered. But ultimately it's a conversation, it's education on both parts, the care provider and, and, uh, and the patient. Yeah, that's great. And again, that skill and teaching it, I think is really important because there is that idea that no one person knows best and you have to remember it's the person's own life and their well-being and they get to make the choices they want. And uh, I often am talking about, you know, the issues of mental capacity and and personhood. And I say, you know, it's about whether or not they can make the decision. It's not necessarily whether they do make the decision. I often explain mental capacity by saying my children have the ability to understand and appreciate not to throw their hockey equipment in the front hall or I'll fall over it, but it doesn't change what they do. And I don't think that they're mentally incapable. I think that they're teenagers. And so we have to understand that social set of choices is really critically important. Nathan, I don't want to leave you out of this conversation. Again, with person-centered care, people necessarily don't want to do it. And maybe just because I get to come to you last, 
I'm going to add that little piece about cognitive impairment that you may be worried about. So this is not where somebody, you know, you're very certain that they're unable to understand and appreciate, but you're kind of thinking they're making decisions that don't fit how they previously did and you're concerned that they might be in the gray zone. How do you navigate those issues of optimal health and well-being when you're kind of entering that navigation of the gray zone with that patient? Um, thanks for that. So, um, you know, capacity, I would argue, is one of the most misunderstood things in all of medical practice um, and one of the most poorly I would say, uh, assessed uh, by many individuals. And, and depending on where you are in the province or in the country, um, you know, the different decisions may fall under different acts, um, which is also not always well known. And, and different individuals may or may not be qualified to assess all forms of capacity. And additionally, there's common misconceptions that capacity is, uh, is fixed when in fact it's dynamic and that it's um, decision specific um, rather than globally um, applicable. So with all that in mind and this backdrop and the misunderstanding that exists around capacity, it can be very challenging because family members may have ideas about capacity in that regard. I think the, the, the two things that I would um, come away with from that is that um, what, firstly, um, you know, you are presumed capable until demonstrated otherwise, which is an important tenet uh, to hold in, in practice. And the second thing is people are allowed to make bad decisions, even if they're capable. And those are the things that I, you know, I'm often discussing with families and healthcare providers when it, it's, you know, talk, when it's about where the person should live, what they should do, and it can be very hard for family to accept. But that's the law and also it's important in, in respecting patient autonomy, including those who are living with cognitive impairment with, and dementia. So I'll leave it uh, at that. I'm gonna sneak one more question. I know we're kind of running into our time, but I do wanna capture the question that we have waiting in our list. So really quick answers, but Diana, what's our last question? Our last question is from Maria Michelinus McLaughlin. Here I am with a chronic illness that is not curable, ravaging the body, but keeping the brain active, trying to be relevant in the present. Yes, arthritis affects 6 million Canadians, but it is not a sexy disease. How do we optimize our ageism so as not to be neglected? All right. Well, that's a hard one. Um, who wants to take it? You got a short answer. John, maybe over to you. Sure. Um, so I, I think that that's again uh, echoes a lot of the things that we've been discussing in, in that um, in that we need to change the expectations as you grow older and the preventive aspects are are are, are really important and and again it should be with uh, with any type of chronic condition it should be what can we do to optimize your function optimize your quality of life given those chronic conditions that you may have accumulated uh, at the present time. So the focus needs to change and it needs to be a holistic look at how we can optimize your quality of life given the stage of life that you're in. Thanks so much, everyone. I, I'm gonna just now help uh, wrap up some of our conversations that we're having today. I invite you to stay on the screen to our expert panel. Thank you so much. What a wonderful set of discussions we've had today, ranging from vaccines to ageism, to ethnocultural issues, to technology, to innovation, arthritis, and how to stay healthy and well, well, trying to navigate those very challenging sometimes patient relationships. I just wanted to let you know that all of this information is available and you'll be able to find it on our website at canage.ca slash webinars. I know our partners will be posting it on there as well. Again, make sure that you take action. Download the copy of the Roadmap to an Age Inclusive Canada and get out your highlighter and choose the pieces that you're going to be working on or go to our dynamic website and you can see it there. Take action, donate, Help Age Canada, one of our co-presenters is starting up an opportunity to donate into some of these areas and support the initiatives that we're trying to move forward on. We can have more information on our website about your opportunities if you wanna take action through your pocketbook. Take action by becoming a member. Please join us, it's a free membership and you're gonna get fabulous resources, amazing newsletters, and more than anything else, you get to bring your voice into 
policy and advocacy with government to make positive change across this country and support the loud and important rigorous need to have older adults be included in the co-design of research make sure that they have their voices at the table for every act of health policy so join us at canage.ca slash join you get the weekend off it's friday and i'm hoping that you're going to join us on monday eastern at 11 a.m till 12 30 where we pick up our free conference again and we're going to do a deeper dive into some of the issues that we touched on lately today infection prevention and disaster response so we're going to be able to make sure that we bring you the best of the best information and again that's monday eastern at 11 to 12 30. then you get a bit of a break but you can see the incredible panelists that we have for you. Don't forget to join again as our free conference continues at 1 Eastern till 2.30, looking at the very challenging issues of caregiving, long-term care, home care, and housing resources. We have voices from the North. We have voices from the West. We have voices from Ontario and everywhere in between. This is going to be a dynamic discussion and builds upon some of the issues that we talked about today. Our panelists bring the best in class to it, each of them a keynote presenter in their own right. Our last day is Tuesday on October 6, 11 again till 1230, that same time where we're going to dig into economic security, looking at retirement, pensions, issues about how to have trusted contact people for those who may be vulnerable or have cognitive impairment. And our last is near and dear to I know all of our hearts, social inclusion, again, in the afternoon session, 1 to 2.30 Eastern, where we're really going to talk about some uplifting issues. How can we make sure that older people are included? What are some of the great practices we're seeing at libraries, in digital literacy, in community, and in housing? All of these information are available with our links. We're sharing this presentation with you as well, and you're going to get information for our evaluation please take just a second and make sure that you do it contact us at any time at info uh, at canage.ca and all of our social media we're very active i know that folks here have fantastic social media accounts and they're also being shared with us go and join up and make sure that you're engaged in what's happening at canadian frailty network one of our sponsors and supporters make sure that you check out nathan's stuff in the morning as i do i wake up every morning and always look at your uh, your feed sharing your social media around it is great and karen you too so wonderful wet sets of resources make sure that you jump on those and share it's my great pleasure to thank our expert panelists today and all of you who so actively participated during this free conference session. Each of you has brought such a rich knowledge to our discussion and it's been a pure pleasure, my real privilege to be able to be your host and moderate today. With that, I will sign off to our expert panel. We're gonna sign off to Facebook Live and thank you, have a wonderful time this weekend and we'll see you again on Monday morning, everyone. Thanks to our experts. We'll see you again next time.